in reply to an email, you know, I was a bit cautious, not coming from a performance background when preparing for this talk. I wrote to you know, musicians, performers, artists, etc. So I wrote an email to a friend who was a jazz drummer. And he replied, uh, and we had this conversation, where he said that, first, we have to establish that improvisation exists only within the framework of rules. These rules, like most laws, do not leave room for inter much room for interpretation, but always consist of several different rules, which exist alongside each other and may be mutually exclusive. So in many cases, a major element of improvisation would be the choice of the rules you follow and the use of a certain freedom within these rules. Only once you have exploited the limits of these existing rules can you transgress and risk the unknown, often establishing new systems or rules that follow their own internal logic. Improvisation for him, then, is the art of choosing between and interpreting existing possibilities or rules and laws. And he says, I can imagine that a big overlaps of the practice of law where you essentially maneuver, interpret, and haggle your way through a dense maze of laws and regulations, trying to find a pathway or route and s that suits your needs and desires. And I imagine that for the initiated, the art of maneuvering this maze could be a very aesthetic process as well. But this idea of managing or haggling your way or finding a way out, for me, is the key to the question of how we get out of the aporia of law and justice. Because justice as, re as improvisation reimagines justice as a species of improvisation within the formal structure of the most basic of legal mechanisms, judicial decision making, offering law and legal theory a richer, more concrete understanding of justice. Improvisation in judgment calls for ongoing practical decision making as the constant negotiation between the freedom of the judge to take account of otherness or singularities of the case and existing laws or rules that both allow for and constrain that freedom. Yes, it is necessary to judge. Yes, it is necessary to decide. But to judge well, to decide justly, that is a music lesson perhaps best taught by improvisation. This is a very different idea from seeing deconstruction or aporia in negative terms or as a nihilistic annihilation of any foundation of justice. Uniting the jazz musician for whom improvisation is a, is a way out of aporia and the act of judgment, which requires a high obligation to the other, seems like one way in which one can create a more optimistic and hopeful vision of justice itself. Derrida himself writes elsewhere that aporia is not simply paralysis. The non-way is the condition of walking. If there was no aporia, we couldn't walk. We couldn't find our path. Path breaking implies aporia. Let me now turn to the second theme that arose from my conversation with Chabri, namely the question of presence and how improvisation relates to the question of presence and justice. Peter Brook more or less summarizes it when he claims that the essence of theater is within a mystery called the present moment. And most theater practitioners, when pushed to define the essence of their medium, cite presence as that which defines the medium beyond any single performance or representation. The idea of presence and liveness, therefore, has been crucial to the ethical and ontological claims of theater. But not everyone is as enamored with the idea of presence. And many critics argue that claims for theater cannot remain innocent of the politics of its own claims of presence. Philip Auslander, for example, in Liveness and Performance, expresses an impatience with the traditional unreflective assumptions that explicate the value of liveness beyond invoking cliches and mystifications in his words, like the magic of live theater, the energy that supposedly exists between performers and spectators in a live event, and the community that live performance is often said to create amongst performers. He's really looking at this entire question of what mediation you know, has done post-technology to the world of liveness and to the idea of presence itself. Now, much of the criticism against the uniqueness of presence is, of course, inspired in turn by people like, like Derrida. And there's a popular joke which says, you know, what is a Derridian Christmas? One without presence, right? So, but the critique of presence, the critique of presence was not necessarily inaugurated by the post-structuralists. Some of the early critiques against presence came from film scholars like Christian Metz, who claimed that because theater is made up of material objects, it inhibits theater's capacity to construct an imaginary world. Theater, he suggests, is too real. The actor's bodily presence contradicts the temptation one always experiences during the show 
to perceive him as a protagonist in a fictional universe. Because the theater is too real, theatrical fictions wield or yield only a very weak impression of reality. The political implications of this is argued by Vivin Patraka, who uses the major example of theaters of the Holocaust and says that they pose a major danger, that the anguish of the suffering body will be conveyed on stage as real and somehow comprehensible, manageable, and able to convey what is actually an immeasurable absence. Extending this critique, Auslander directs his own critique of liveness at the increasing ways in which it can be reproduced and made into a saleable commodity. Anyone who watched the SRT 200 will bear testimony you know, to this entire question of how liveness has become, in that sense, so commodified in the contemporary. For Auslander, theater's valorization of presence displays a lack of awareness of the relationship between presence and structures of authority. Presence, he argues, is a specific problematic that theater theorists and practitioners must confront in re-examining their assumptions about political theater and its function. And we have to recognize presence as a matrix of power in theater. So how do we reconcile this now? This debate between, on the one hand, for any performer, you know that this idea of presence in the relationship of the moment is crucial. And yet at the same time, there seems to be this mystical space that presence goes into. I found it very useful to follow Cormac Power's suggestion in her book, which examines all of the critiques of presence, that presence is perhaps not a single thing which a number of the post-structuralists, while writing about presence, have had writing in mind. But if you look, for example, at the way that presence works in theater, she suggests that it might be more useful to unpack the idea of presence into three constitutive and qualitative components. The first one she describes as the making present, which is you know, the entire mise-en-scene of, of presence itself. The second is, of course, having presence, which is the force and energy of the performer, or the oratic power of the performer. And the last one is the being present, which is the presence of the audience. And I can't think of a performance more powerful than Marina Abramo, which is the artist's present, in which all three really kind of come together. Presence may be best seen as a function of theater where theater is a place where different levels of presence are played and manipulated with, rather than an essential attribute of theater. And in a very interesting sentence, she says that theater affirms its presence by making presence enigmatic. This seems true for, for Derrida as well, the idea of the enigmatic, who in his book says that he's less interested in doing away with presence as much as unraveling it. To make enigmatic what one thinks one understands by the words proximity, immediacy, and presence is the final intention of my book, he says. So in that sense, theater seems very suited to making presence enigmatic where the immediate is represented, where the character or stage world is in proximity while being, of course, in a very real sense, absent. And the example that Powers cites is that of Samuel Beckett's play, Crap's Last Tape. For those unfamiliar with the play, this is basically the protagonist, Crap, sitting on a table, listening, to a tape recorder that plays out from his journal and all his memories for like you know two or three decades. Here is this strange idea of a presence before you, except that it's mediated by the tape recorder. And crap every once in a while intervenes by coughing, by taking a walk, by going to the, his kitchen and getting a drink, etc. She claims that by highlighting rather than evading the present relationship between stage and auditorium, Beckett is able to provide and explore the impossibility of ever being fully present on the one hand or of simply removing presence from the equation on the other. But I want to return to this word, the idea of the enigmatic. What does it mean to make presence enigmatic? How do we think, for example, of the idea of the enigmatic as a conceptual contrast to the idea of the mystical? We began with identification of the mystical foundations of authority. What may it mean then to think about an enigmatic foundation? One of the most useful explorations of the idea of the enigmatic comes from an exploration of the idea of what the cinematic image in the present means. And Laura Marx in her works basically <coughs> says that she asks the question, where does an image come from? In a world that is inundated with images, what does it mean to identify something as an image? Similarly, in a world that's inundated with mediation, what does it mean to speak of the enigma of presence? Her argument is that the information era, the layer of information that in a way mediates between 
an absolute virtuality to something becoming an image constantly threatens the possibility that an image will be enfolded within the logic of information. If you take, for example, the production of millions of hours of footage by surveillance cameras, by, 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 the, by, by mainstream media, the hyper-mediation along with the hyper-secret and the hyper-publicity constantly risks swallowing up and enfolding the idea of the image into becoming you know, information. So what does it mean for an image to unfold from the regime of information? The act of unfolding is a competition of forces that constantly resists this idea of the unfolding. And between an, a regime of information and secrecy that constantly renders everything more opaque to the possibility of an image that offers us the possibilities of new imaginations of life. I read her distinction of the enfolding, unfolding aesthetics as mirroring my concern with the idea of the mystical and the enigmatic. If at the heart of the law is a mystical foundation of authority, in what manner may be it rendered susceptible to an enigmatic unfolding of justice as a forceful affect that defies the secret at the heart of law? The question of why it is possible to be moved deeply by a play or performance where we know that bits and pieces of our own immediate real world are arranged and rearranged before us to present an often absent, often fictional world is nothing if not enigmatic. Stanley Kevel claimed for cinema that its ontology consisted in showing us a world where things which are absent in time can be present in space. Let me now turn, and I'll come to my conclusion after this, towards one form of speech act, an improvisation of a gesture invented by theater, the silent scream and its multiple variations. But the one that I want to focus on takes us back to the relationship between the missing body and the transformational possibilities of theaters presencing itself, of, of, presencing of itself and, and the body. And I want to read three kind of extracts. The first one, is Mahashweta Devi's Hazar Chaurasya Ki Maa, which I saw as a, a performance. Sujata's long drawn out, heartrending, poignant cry burst, exploded like a massive question spread throughout all the houses of the city, crept underneath the city, rose to the sky. The winds carried it from one end of the state to the other, from one corner of the earth to another, to the dark piles and pillars that stood witness to history, and beyond history into the foundations of faith that underlie the scriptures. The cry set oblivion itself, the present and future, a tremble, reeling under its impact. All the contentment in every happy existence cracked into pieces. It was a cry that smelt of blood, protest, and grief. Then everything went dark. Sujata's body fell to the ground. Dibyanath screamed. The appendix had burst. My second example is Charlotte Delbo's bringing together of the demonstrations of the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo in Argentina with the figure of Antigone. And in her poem, the sorrows over the loss of family members who remain unburied squeezes their throats and make it impossible for them to speak. So they're so anguish stricken that they cannot cry out. They're marked by a cry over a loss that is literally stuck in their throats. It marks their body with speechlessness. They cannot articulate this cry as a message conveyed consciously and, articul and, uh, and articulated in language. But the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo, when they walk round and round, manage to release out of this muteness a silent cry. And Elbow writes, round and round their whole shriek, beings shriek, their tight-locked mouths shriek, a shriek that won't come forth, a blank shout, their tight-locked mouths shriek, a blank shout. And in a similar vein, my third example, which is Griselda Gambaro's Antigona Furiosa, the Argentinian version of Antigone, written in the context of the trial of the junta after Argentina's dirty war, pays tribute again to the mothers of the plaza. In Antigona Furiosa, upon discovering the corpse of Polynices, the stage directions of the scene reads, long silent howl upon discovering Polynices' corpse, which is represented only by a shroud. Antigona throws herself on him and with her own body, covering him from head to toe. This circular repetitive narrative of Antigona Furiosa sets the events of Sophocles' Antigone in the past, present, and the future, while the narrative structure of the play creates 
a meta-theatrical kind of ref self-referentiality about character, performance, rehearsal, and presence. Within the context of the dirty war, the circularity and lack of closure reminds audiences of the thousands of bodies that would still not been accounted for, recovered, or buried. I still want to bury Polynices, she says at the play's end. I will want to bury him a thousand times, th though a, a thousand times I will live and he a thousand times will die. This idea of the repetition as a theme and of improvisation is really the key for me of how we think of the openness of justice to its own possibilities of, of transformation. The last quote that I want to end with is George Steiner's review of Brecht's Mother Courage, where he describes Helen Weigel's performance in the following manner. And he says, as the body of her son is laid before her by the soldiers for her to identify, she merely nods her head in denial. The soldiers compel her to look again, and she merely gives them a dead stare. As the body is carried off, Weigel looks the other way and tears her mouth wide open. Steiner says that the shape of her mouth was that of the screaming horse in Picasso's Guernica. The sound that came out was raw and terrible, beyond any description, but that in fact there was no sound, nothing. It was the silence that screamed through the entire theater so that the audience lowered its head as before a gust of wind. It is to this idea of the possibilities of a performance and of theater in radically moving through our bodies in a way that affectively transforms our possibilities of acting. It's the mode that allows us to imagine not from an abstract realm of rules and norms, but from a lived experience of what the possibilities of being open to the idea of justice might actually be. There is perhaps no better way for me to end this talk when, than with this image that I've left behind. It's a singular and powerful image of a performance and of a moment, which at the same time throws us back to a past and a future where this moment inaugurated by Antigone, carried forth by the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo, returns to us via Imphal, via an act of improvisation, a moment and a performance that serves as the haunting claim that justice will forever make on the law. And wherever justice is absent from the law, it may find no greater ally to make itself present than the rival jurisdiction established by theater. And ho I hope I've been able to partially demonstrate how theater, in a way, claims its enigmatic foundations of authority as one that derives its force and authority from the fact that it is in the slightest gestures, the silent scream being just one of them, the slightest gestures that have the ability of producing a perceptual shift, a dilation almost, that expands our perceptive possibilities of justice. And living as we do at the crossroads, at the aporia, when injustice constantly threatens to overwhelm us, we could not have asked for a better lesson to be learnt from a single life to help us overcome the aporia than that of Saftar Hashmi and the legacy that he leaves behind through Sehmat and Janam. Thank you. <laughs>